bless you. Hey, how's it going, man? I want the normal, my usual. Yeah, actually, we have a couple girls in line already. If I can just get you moved to the back, and I'll help you as soon as I'm done with that. But sorry about that. Last be first, first be last. Dude, do you go to church at all? Do you go to church at all? So, do you go to church at all? Hey, is this seat open? Hey, is this seat available? Uh, dude, I just wanted to knock out some devos real quick. Spend some time with Jesus. I woke up kind of late this morning. Yeah, come on, let's go to Let's go. Let's sit down. I just want to share something from God's word. He hit me up in my devos this morning. I was like, I got to share this. Genesis 1 1. Thirsty, huh? Get some water. <laughs> yeah, I know the living water. I was noticing that you're drawing some stuff over here. Back before when I wasn't a Christian, I, I was making so much money as a graphic designer. You've been born again? You've been born again? Again. And you need to go walking in the flesh. I mean, obviously you don't really know God, your tattoos, and, you know, your ear and stuff. You don't start out the day by just bathing yourself in prayer. The day doesn't even go that well. You're not realizing that there is a God. He sent Jesus to die for you. Why don't you see that? And in chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, I just would go to these crazy parties. It was crazy. Well, I mean, just cash like crazy. But uh, but I've left all that behind. Now I'm a Christian. You can't live life without God. He's not real. He's here. I can't yes, see him. I'm just not getting here. Yeah, God is real. Touch him. Yeah, you can't touch Africa. But Africa exists. I just have to say, I'm blessed. Too blessed to be stressed by the devil's mess. What's holding you back from committing your life to Jesus Christ? It's probably the sin in your life is what's going on. Scary? Hella scary. Why don't you look at that girl? Look at her. She's gonna die. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. She's gonna die. If you're gonna die. Where do you think you'll go? Man, that sounded hot. I wonder how hot hell is. Hopefully you don't go there. Oh, this is good. The New Testament is so just applicable. Have you guys noticed this? Hey, you gotta be washed by the blood of the Lamb. I mean, so that you are justified, sanctified, future glorified. I and mean, this is amazing. You gotta come out. Do you drive a Volkswagen? Yeah, yeah, I do. But regardless, man, you gotta come to church. Hey, remember what I said? Hell is scary. <laughs> not so much fun with the hell not to. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> Right. So, <laughs> if you picked out anything in there that, uh, well, put it this way, if you picked out everything in there that uh, that you shouldn't do, then you pretty much you can go home right now because you can got it all. All right. Uh, well, now we'll hit a couple other things. All right. So, uh, first of all, uh, from last uh, last month, did anybody uh, have a chance to kind of look it over and uh, well, homework assignment? Did you get a chance to do that? A cool bit. Yeah, a cool little bit. All right. Any, any, anything that you want to share? Well, we were talking about sort of the, you know, the where and what what situations that we find ourselves in, and and, and I I actually really struggle with that because I spend all of my work, I mean, I, I mostly encounter people at my work and pretty much all the people at my work are not, not the least bit religious, or at least, at least they're not, they're not talking about it and it would be pretty, uh, it would, it would feel a lot like that <laughs> movie to try to talk about it overtly at, at work. And, and so, I mean, I, I, I find it hard thinking about how to how to do meaningful outreach in the work setting that's meaningful and and not like that <laughs> so that was one thing we talked about okay and a mind that comes up over and over with my family is uh, with my siblings and their kids is well my for instance my brother's an atheist and his kids are not baptized and I've been praying about that forever. Yeah. And um, I don't know if so, there's maybe something here that will help me um, help me help them. But I, I mean, I don't know, you know. So, but one thing I noticed is, gosh, when I'm in my family situation, I can completely forget about about how Jesus calls us to live, and I can get into, I mean, the expression I grew up with is taking their inventory, and, you know, I can kind of get in there and fight for what I want instead of just sort of letting it happen, and so I, I would like to, that's going to be a tricky one for me. And then, and then we were talking about how sometimes, like, one-on-one -on -one is more, 
you feel like you can have something to give, but in a bigger group setting, like we're having neighbors over for coffee, it's coming up in two weeks, <laughs> and um, in a group setting, sometimes I get all nervous, you know, because there's all these people, and I'm almost like, why am I doing this? But at the same time, hospitality is one of our gifts. We like doing that. Okay. All right. Good. Anyone else? I just was to get more focus on when you do pray for these people. Um, it's kind of like you say the prayer and then it's just kind of gone. Like, okay, God, you've got this right now. I can just move forward with it. And then each day passes and says, we didn't pray for them today. And just trying to figure out what is it that I can say when I pray about them and so whatever feedback you have. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Hey, grab one of our sheets for myself. Um, yeah, those are good thoughts, and um, and, and I'll, I'll say with the with the prayer thing, um, that the more you, you know, I, I find for myself that having some sort of reminder somewhere is really helpful um, for that, and we'll get into that actually more next month, um, but. Uh, but like I, I have you know bracelets on my arm that, that help me remember to pray for certain people um, and, and things like that. I, little just little rituals that I do, um, and uh, and those things help me uh, for different people. Different things are, are helpful. Um, so we will get to more of that um, next month definitely. Um, so, but uh, you know some of it is just sort of raising your awareness. It's, it's just, it's, it's actually looking out and, and seeing, um, you know, I, I remember when back that Thanksgiving weekend when we first, when I first received the call here and, um, and I, and I came and, and I remember it was Black Friday and, um, and we were at Target just stopping to pick up a couple things and, um, it wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been on Black Friday, right? But I'm looking around and, and I just like the words mission field just like kept, you know, coming at me. And, um, uh, yeah. and, uh, but, but yeah, how do you do that? And, and, and we will, um, you know, today what we're going to do is, is the how not to, and, and that'll, um, uh, that'll get a start on, on how to, just as you see kind of what to avoid. I kind of want to get that stuff out of the way for first. <laughs> um, and uh, and so hopefully that'll be helpful, and then we can kind of um, then next week or next month. I mean, is going to be kind of preparation, preparing yourself, um, and then uh, and then we'll get into the sort of mechanics of of it, so to speak. All right, but we'll already hit on some of that um, this week, and uh, as we talk about the don'ts, uh, there will be a little bit of do um, kind of combined with that. All right. So, um, so the first thing is uh, formulas, all right? Um, <laughs> this is a tweet that when I was first putting this together uh, last time, this, this popped up to somebody that, that I follow, and, and I just thought it was so, just so applicable to this. Um, what, what I think when a stranger knocks on my door, I hope I don't get murdered, but I will never think I'd sure like to buy something, <laughs> all right? Um, and... And how much more so is is this true of is someone someone knocks on the door and they say, "Well, I would like this total stranger's thoughts on the meaning of life and God and you know and stuff like that." And the thing is, now understand that uh, the the two examples that are up there, evangelism explosion, uh, the guy by the name of Kennedy made that popular, and, and in fact, you probably heard the the gist of it um, is if you die tonight uh, and you stood before God. Uh, and he said, "Why should I let you know I have it? Uh, what, how would you answer?" And um, and and that was hugely popular in the '70s. I want to say um, I can't remember the exact date when that came out, but I mean, it's it's enough that most people are at least familiar with that question that it was all kind of based on. And it was that door to door kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, DE2 is Dialogue Evangelism 2. That's something the that Missouri Synod came out with. And, um, and that's, I was trained in that when I went to seminary. Um, and we did it. 
Um, we, as part of the class that I was taking, um, we had an evangelism weekend. We connected with the local church. We went out. I, I mean, I'll never forget it because it was uh, here we are in, in um, Missouri where they cannot handle snow. I mean, like they, they actually cancel schools before when snow is forecasted, <laughs> right? Before they ever see a flake. And, um, and, and so this was a weekend where, I mean, it was snow like what's on the ground for us right now. Wow. And the whole city was just shut down. But man, we went, and it was great because we'd go to house to house and it was, and it was cold and it, it was snowy. And, and, um, and so, you know, we'd knock on somebody's door and say, hey, hi, we're, you know, we're here on behalf of a such and such church. And, and they're like, just come, on, come in, come in. Like, it's too cold out, you know, to, to stand here with the door open. Come on in. And they kind of felt sorry for us being out there. And, and so it actually worked um, in, in a sense in that we did have the chance to have some good conversations. Right. Um, after that, when, once I was a pastor, I connected with a, an organization called Ongoing Ambassadors for Christ. Um, that also it was a youth organization where they would uh, this group would connect with various churches um, in in their their districts and um, and would we'd do door to door stuff. We'd do puppet ministry and and singing and stuff like that. And it was all a really great weekend. But I also felt, I mean, and back then I, I still, you know, the door to door stuff, um, they had their own formulas to use and, and things like that. Um, and, and, and they're still around. Uh, it's not as big as it used to be. And, and that doesn't surprise me because they're still following this model. Uh, unfortunately it's great for the kids because I mean, they're, they're just centered around God's word all weekend. It's just, it's a phenomenal program to that point. And, and it gives them some practice sharing their faith. But I mean, you know, we go out and, and hit like a hundred houses and you get maybe one or two, um, sort of positive responses. And, um, and I remember getting some, some pretty negative responses too. And, um, and so <clears throat> The, nowadays, people are even less likely to open their doors to, you, um, to you know, to, even even if they know who you are, uh, they'd like advance notice that you're coming, and um, and it's it's hard to find uh, you know people home. Uh, people are so busy; they're not at home as much anymore, and stuff like that. And, and a lot of people just aren't even used to face to face contact. <laughs> Um, I mean, you talk to people that, uh, that you'd say they won't even answer their phones, even if they know who it is. And they'll say, if you want to get a hold of me, you know, is it, well, what if I call you? I'll let it go to voicemail. And once I find out what you want, I'll text you back. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, you know, so so it can be downright intimidating and at the very least annoying for people if you just go knock on the doors, right? Well, this same thing is true of um, of you know walking up somebody in a coffee shop or or uh, or even somebody at work you know that you know um, to just sort of take this this formula and um, use it. Now there are times, and and we'll get to those where these things can be helpful. All right, so they're not all bad. But, um, and then sometimes it's, it's helpful to have some illustrations, um, uh, sort of in your back pocket, so to speak, uh, so that when, when an opportunity does arise, that you have a sense of, oh, now what? <laughs> and, uh, and we'll get to that in, in a couple of months. Um, but just, you know, for now, it's not... I mean, you notice that when, when Jesus was out doing his ministry, he didn't have a formula. And, um, and there's a reason for that. We'll get to that. All right. Um, <laughs> this is, I, I don't know if, if you could see this, um, but uh, this, this, is a, this, is a, this is a picture that I took uh, in a grocery store. All right. So it's, it's wine. It was in the, in the wine section of the grocery store. And, and there is a pamphlet sitting there 
that says heaven or hell. Um, uh, it's a little too blurry. Uh, it's something like one or the other. Which will you choose? Right, and it's sitting by bo- these bottles of wine in the liquor section, and that just cracked me up because I thought, are they pointing out the fact that in several places in the Bible that heaven is described as a place with fine wine? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what they had in mind. Probably not. <laughs> no. But um, but at the same time, it, it does emphasize that uh, that a lot of times when people are thinking about uh, sharing Christ with people. They're focused on works. All right. Um, there was uh, a few years back, there was a, a big um, to do about wanting to have the Ten Commandments on a, in a courthouse. All right. And I, it was national news and, and all stuff. And it was a really big deal about it. And, and uh, why? Okay. So it was, it was the Christians that were pushing for this. Why? Do they want that? And, um, and, 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 okay, so they're hoping that this is going to connect people with God, right? But at the same time, it's the law. Like, literally, it's the law, <laughs> all right? And the law doesn't say it. Only the gospel saves. And, um, and, and so I thought, oh, I mean, you know, people have their reasons and, 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 uh, I, it, I'm not, I'm not real big on taking you know sort of public political positions or anything, but I thought at least you know just from that is not a battle that I would fight. Okay. Um, and and part of the problem is that in um, in a lot of churches or or just like Christian social communities, um, they have this process: behave, believe, belong. Right. First, you get your life in order. You start acting a certain way, right? And then we'll we'll tell you about Jesus, and um, and then when you believe, then you can be one of us. All right. Um, but that's kind of problematic. Another way of doing it in in other groups is believe, behave, belong. All right. Well, okay. We understand that you have no motivation to change the way you live until you know Jesus and what he's done for you. All right? That is correct. All right? Expecting, you know, never expect the lost to act like they're not lost. All right? And so, so expecting people to change their behavior first, that just says that you've got to be worthy. And the whole point of Christianity is we're, none of us is worthy. Right, and so, um, so actually, just as common is that okay. Once you believe what we teach, all right, then that's going to change the way that you act, and then you can be one of us, right? Which still puts an emphasis on works. And the interesting thing is, when you look at the way that Jesus uh, worked with his disciples, all right. First of all, did they believe in him? right off the bat. No, I mean, they really didn't get who he was and what he was about until Pentecost. It was, he had already risen and ascended into heaven, and they're still trying to figure it out. All right. But they did believe that, that, you know, that he's the Christ. They just didn't understand what that was all about. All right? But... Their behavior? I mean, man, you even get into the book of Acts and you've got Paul telling Peter, hey, you're acting all racist and, and what is your deal? And, you know, and, and, and I love one of the things I love about the Bible is that, that to me is, is a real evidence that, that this is the real thing is that that kind of stuff is included. And it was stuff that, that Peter, you know, something like that, Peter could have easily said, um, hey, Luke, don't publish that part. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because it makes me look bad. All right? And, um, and, and so, in and, and most uh, sort of, you know, holy book uh, traditions and things like that, um, the, the sort of heroes are... <coughs> 
you know, they're, they're heroes. I mean, we're working with the youth group and, and we're telling them the story of David and Bathsheba. <laughs> and David is a man after God's own heart. All right? The greatest king Israel ever had because of his faith. And so what does he do? He sleeps with a woman and then has her husband, tries, first of all, gets her husband drunk to try to get him to sleep with her to cover up the fact that it's his baby, right? And then when the guy is so loyal to him that he says, no, 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 I couldn't do that. Not while, you know, the armies of Israel are still out on the battlefield. That just wouldn't be right. Then he has the guy killed. Right? We're telling the story to the, the kids on Wednesday night, and, and, and one of them, who has a church background, goes, wait a minute, and this is one of the, one of the uh, role models in the Bible? <laughs> we said, <laughs> said, no. <laughs> in fact, as far as role models in the Bible go, there's, besides Jesus, that's pretty much it. Well, actually, some of the women, like no men, uh, Ruth, you know, she's pretty great, and, uh, and, and there's a couple others uh, like that. Um, you know, uh, Mary Magdalene does pretty well in, in that. Um, uh, and, but, but, you know, I mean, it's just like, no. The whole point is that the Bible is about broken people that God saved in spite of themselves. I mean, Abraham passed off his wife as his sister, you know, and then his son does the exact same thing, right? I mean, just you go on and on, and, and they're all just so flawed. And, but that's the point, is that this is not about behaving. Um, I, was, I was talking to uh, the guys from the Christian band Lost and Found, um, and uh, and they were talking about how you know they 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 go to different churches and and they'd sing and and stuff and and then they would um, and afterward there'd be uh, sort of Bible classes and or something like that kind of a follow up and and he says you know and so here we are we're singing about Jesus and his love and forgiveness and grace and all this stuff and then um and then and then the, the leaders kind of gather up the youth and 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 their the gist of their messages behave. <laughs> And he's going, there's such a disconnect. And, and he said, you know, it's not that we're against behaving, all right? We are pro-behavior, all right? But at the same time, that's not the main point, all right? That comes along afterward. That's, that, that, that is, that's when God changes your life. It's not, there's no duress with it. Um, and I could go on that all night. Right? <laughs> so, um, so next point: corporate worship is a means to an end, not the end. All right. This is uh, we run into this um, on a fairly regular basis. I, I run into this all over the place. That really sort of like, what's the goal? What's the goal of? Um, you know, like our youth group where we have a lot of kids coming in that don't know Jesus. All right, what's the goal of the different, you know, programs that we have um, in, you know, whether it's a uh, 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 community uh, service thing or, or going and doing Feed My Serving Children or whatever it is, all right? What's the goal? And, and so often the focus tends to be on sort of like how, to, what's the win? And it is butts in the pews. And, um, and, and, and sometimes, I, I don't see this here, but it's also the expression is nickels and noses, all right? It's, it's butts in the pews and money in the offering plate, all right? Well, first of all, as far as money in the offering plate goes, if you're reaching out to people who don't know Jesus, the wallet is the last part of the body to be converted. <laughs> all right? It just, it takes a while for the person to get to that point, right? And, and it takes, and, and just like, that's like saying, I'm going to have a kid um, as a, to, so I can make money. 
All right. Kids cost money. Now, eventually, you know, even if you, you know, sort of live on a farm or something and you want to have some farm hands uh, as they get older or whatever, it's quite a while before they're really able to help out. And you still have to put more into them than what you get out of them. All right. And, and the same is true of baby Christians. All right. They, they're st still figuring stuff out. All right, and and while on the one hand uh, I've seen a lot of people that um, boy they they meet Jesus and <laughs> this is so great, and then they go and they're telling all their friends and stuff like that, and it's wonderful because they're so excited, and um, and yet at the same time, uh, you know, as as far as just sort of resources, they use more resources than they than they contribute, um, just because they're not equipped yet. Uh, that takes time. Um, and, and so, while corporate worship is a wonderful gift from God, all right, and He gives us so many great gifts, all right, I am not anti corporate worship, okay? I spend a good chunk of my time focused on that and, and doing the best I can to make it the best it, that it can be, all right? But at the same time, the goal is connecting people with Jesus. <clears throat> corporate worship is a means to do that, right? It is a way to, um, to gather around God's gifts and receive his gifts together, right? It is a tremendous blessing. But going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger, right? It's just not the way it works. Now, you hear the word of God, and God's word is living and active, and there's no question about that. All right. And so that is one way, is a means to connect people with Jesus, inviting them to church. All right. Hey, I'm, and, uh, you know, it could be something as simple as, uh, hey, you know, Sunday mornings, I, I go to church or Monday evenings, whatever. And, and um, you know, let's, uh, how would, you, would you like to come with me? And then we'll, uh, I'll, I'll pick you up and then we'll go out and, you know, grab a burger or a coffee or whatever afterward or, you know, or something like that. All right. It's a great way to connect because, you know, and the thing is, people are curious if they don't have that to say, you know, I'll, I'll be there with you if you have questions, happy to answer them and, you know, and stuff like that. And, and it's a, it's a great way to, um, to just, to open up a conversation, right? Um, but, you know, you've got to have enough of a relationship where people are willing to do that too, right? And so we'll get to that more later, but just for now, it's a means to an end. It is not the end. All right? Some people just never feel comfortable in a particular... And sometimes it's a, it's a matter of what kind of worship service. All right? For some people, some people are really uh, uncomfortable in uh, sort of a formal liturgical service, and you can take them to services that are more like a concert, and they're a lot more comfortable with that. All right? For other people, it's exactly the opposite. Because they feel like like those the more casual ones like I thought you know I kind of wanted to meet God and um, and this just feels like a rock concert I, I can go to a rock concert you know somewhere else any any time and, and probably hear better music so um, but that also ties in with the next one is the kingdom is greater than the congregation All right um, this is something that that I told St. James um, when I uh, when I was called and, or, be, or when I was interviewed before I was called here. Uh, something I've told every congregation that, that's ever interviewed me for a call is that I am not, I don't do membership drives. All right? I'm about connecting people with Jesus. And so if, if I meet somebody, if I'm talking to somebody and, um, and I have a sense that they will be much more comfortable in a different church different denomination, whatever, all right, I'm going to get them connected with that. Um, <laughs> at my last church, we actually listed, we had a, on our sort of about page um, on our website, we had links to the other local area churches um, and said, we know that we're not going to meet every, be able to meet everybody's needs, so if we can't, please check one of these out. Um, and... Um, and you know, there's, there's times where I don't agree with some of the stuff they're saying. Sometimes I go, oh, don't, you know, 
But you know what? There's other times where there's, uh, um, you know, being a, a Missouri Synod pastor, I've been in Missouri Synod churches, and I went, no, don't! <laughs> All right. um, and, and so... So there's no guarantees, and, and I know that there's been times where um, where I've I've thought back on one of my sermons or something like that, and went, oh, don't, oh, I can't believe I said that. All right, so they're all flawed, including here. And um, so we're not about connecting people to congregation. Now, again, congregation is a means to an end. All right, God has given us the church, the gathering of people, and, and before I mentioned about people are uncomfortable with um, that sort of face-to-face -face kind of stuff, but at the same time, people desperately want it. I mean, it, like, it's ingrained in us. Even if you're uh, an introvert and, and a hardcore introvert, you still want at least a couple close friends, all right? It's not good for men to be alone. That's absolutely true, and it's not just true of, of marriage, all right? It's God made us to, to need each other, all right? And that's something that the church... Um, just desperately needs, uh, or, or rather has, and, and uh, needs for each other, and but also needs for the world. I mean, that was, in the, in the early church, what really connected, I mean, yeah, okay, there are miracles and, and things like that, and certainly that helped, okay? But over and over, it was, see how they love each other, All right? And, and we live in a world where people are desperate to be loved, to be really, truly loved. Um, loved with the love of Christ. And we offer that. We have that. And by if we can connect them to a congregation where there's other people where they can experience that, great. Now, that also puts an onus on the congregation to actually live that, okay? Um, and none of us are perfect at that either. And But at the same time, we also need to recognize that um, the, the goal is to connect them with Jesus. And, and so, no, I, I, need, I just need to emphasize that this is not, these two things are not mutual, ex, mutually exclusive, right? That um, the, the, the church, as in the, 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 the one holy Christian apostolic church, right, is this tremendous gift, right? God designed faith to be collective, is not is not intended to be an individual thing. And in, in America, we're so individualistic that um, that we've turned faith into this personal, individual thing. And um, and and okay, personal, sure, but not private. And um, and, and, and faith, but it's it's something that was intended to be shared because that's how we build each other up. All right, so things to avoid. I hear this. Tim is on the internet. He sees something that offends him, but he ignores it and moves on with his life. Good move, Tim. All right, it can be so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have, um, just for myself, uh, for my own peace of mind, I've, I've set limits on. Um, I'm only ever on Facebook for a half hour a day. Um, after that, my my mobile devices pop up and, and go. You've reached your time limit, right? Um, because I realized that it was it was sucking out my time, right? But also, um, I also realized don't do it right before you go to bed, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then I get angry. <laughs> um, because I see stuff that I disagree with and, and I just, you know, want to jump in and, and go, no, 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 you're wrong. Let me straighten that up. Okay. And so when we're trying to connect people with the love of Christ, divisive confrontation is not an effective way to do that. Um, getting in people's faces, then you get like that opening video. And, um, and I see, I, I see so many, um, it especially bothers me when I see my pastor friends posting, um, not not even just political stuff, but but like rhetoric, and and some of it is, is just like it's not even correct, and um, 
But, but the thing is, also sort of jumping in and attacking them for the way that they're acting, then you're just doing the same thing. All right. Um, but divisive confrontation, while social media is just a prime place where it happens all over, um, because it's more anonymous, even if your name is attached to it, just people act differently um, when they're not actually face to face with somebody. And um, and so you know, it's always a good rule of thumb to, to say, if, if you use social media, to say, um, all right, is this something I would say to this person's face? Or how, if, if I wanted to talk to this person about this, how would I say it to their face? How would I say it over a cup of coffee with them? All right. Um, um, oh, oh, before, speaking of social media, a big example um, that I thought of as I was working on a different piece of this, but um, remember the, the Starbucks uh, Christmas scandal a couple of years ago? Um, that they came out with uh, with red snowy cups, and um, and some pastor somewhere went. They took Christ out of Christmas, and it just blew up. And 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 there were a handful of people. I mean, it, it actually wasn't that many Christians that that jumped on this. But it was sort of just enough that those who are wary of Christians went, those Christians are crazy. Are they expecting that every company that does anything Christmas related has to have a nativity scene on their, you know, on their stuff? All right. He went, like Starbucks has never, I mean, they're not a Christian company. They're also not an anti-Christian company. They will sell coffee to anybody. They would just want your money. All right? And um, and so, but this, I mean, I, I still, this was a couple years ago, and it, and it kind of died down, and, and people went, oh, yeah. But um, but I still see every year on Christmas time, my atheist friends bring it up again and mock it. Right? They remember. They go, those ridiculous Christians. And, um, <laughs> and, and and at those times when they do that, <laughs> when I see it, usually I either go, um, I either just ignore it, right? Or I'll say, yeah, that was really embarrassing. And, and just own it, right? Because sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes, and, and um, you know, when you get... Uh, Oh, people like Pat Robertson and stuff that they come out saying all kinds of ridiculous things like, oh, well, Haiti got hit by a, um, you know, by a hurricane or tsunami um, because of, you know, God's punishing them for boo or something like that, you know. And, um, you know, and those are times where you, where you go, on the one hand, you go, all right, even though I completely disagree with pretty much everything he says, all right, he's still a brother in Christ. He's family, all right? And you know what? I have family members that embarrass me, but they're still family, all right? And so so we tread lightly and go, yeah, Christians do some really dumb things sometimes, don't we? And I, I'm really sorry for that. I, I don't agree with that. I know, you know, I don't know any Christians that do, all right? But, but yeah, it happens, all right? Um, I've also found the the um the power of humility because there have been times where I've made some brash statement and my atheist friends call me on it and uh, and I go oh yeah you're right I'm sorry and you know what that's powerful because they're expecting you to, to, you know, dig in your heels and and um, and keep fighting it. And when you just go, no, you're right. You're right. I I was completely out of line there. Um, and and they go, oh. <laughs> and um, you know, because a lot of them have this this kind of picture in their head of of you know pushy Christians that won't back down for anything and stuff like that. And boy, when you can 
or, or even when you can say, uh, you know what, please explain to me your position. Because it's, I, I see things completely differently. Help me to see things through your eyes. All right. We'll get to that more in, in, um, in a little bit. Um, family gatherings. All right. I already mentioned that. Okay. Um, this is another place that uh, you can quickly have divisive confrontation. All right. Um, all right. I'm not going to tell you how to be a, a sibling, a parent, a child, or whatever, you know. It is, okay? Um, but you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. I know it's a cliche, but it's true. Um, and uh, and we'll, we'll come back around to this later. Um, but this also applies to any kind of social gatherings. Um, you know, we're really all about making connections. If you look at the way that Jesus connected with people, it always amazes me. I may have even said this last week um, or last month, but the people that Jesus hung around with, or for one thing, were the sort of people that if they showed up in a lot of churches, everyone would look at them like, what are you doing here? And it's always astounded me that Jesus hung around with the sort of people that don't want to hear about sin. <clears throat> and um, that, that everyone just looked down on and, and said, these are the worst people imaginable. And, and Jesus never backed down on his message. Right? He, didn't, he never compromised the truth. Right? He was very open about what he believed and what, and what he taught. And yet, they loved him. They thought he was great. And I look at that and I go, okay, well, now I look at the world now, and in our culture, Western culture, is you compare it to the Roman Empire, and we're not quite there yet. All right? We're getting there in a lot of ways, but we're not there yet. We don't have uh, public baths. Um, in downtown, um, where everybody just goes and hangs out naked together and, and does whatever happens to come to mind when they're all hanging out naked together. All right, as much as people complain about Western culture, we're not there. Okay, we don't have you know temple prostitutes and, and things like that, and yet these are these are people that you know, involved in that kind of stuff that heard about Jesus and about this guy's great. Now, if the way that we communicate causes, and I mean, I'm even hesitant to sort of categorize people because I don't want to give the impression that they're worse than us or something like that, okay? But for the sake of the statement, <clears throat> if people like that love Jesus, but when they look at the Christian church today, they say, I don't want to have anything to do with that, then we're doing something wrong. And we're not doing it like Jesus did it. And because and the same was true, it wasn't just Jesus. He'd go, oh, Jesus is the Son of God, of course, you know, he's perfect, right? But the same was true of the early church, and it was added to their number daily those who were being saved. Right? And, um, and they were coming from all different walks of life. And so, so what were they doing differently? Well, there were times where, you know, Paul stands up in the, um, and, and he says, Hey, I notice you guys are really religious. You even found this altar to an unknown God. You want to cover all your bases. All right, let me tell you about him. His name is Jesus. All right? But what was he doing? All right, and people look at that and go, yeah, you know, he just like went, went out there. He didn't have established relationships with anybody or anything. No, but he was in this area where everybody did that. 
it was where all the philosophers and stuff hung out, right? And so it was, it was expected. People came with all kinds of ideas, and they'd share them, and then they'd debate them, and, and stuff like that. That was, it was a specific space dedicated to that, all right? He didn't walk into the public baths and start doing that. His message would not have been received the same way. Right? And so, so context. And, um, and, and he was able to, to sort of talk and debate because these were people that were used to that. They enjoyed that. Right? I have atheist friends that I debate with all the time because they enjoy it. And we respect each other. And, and, and at the end of the day, we can, you know, get to the point where we're at a standstill and, and neither one of us, um, you know, has convinced the other one of anything. But we understand each other a little bit better. We understand where the other person is coming from a little bit better. And then we can throw some jokes around or, you know, kick back and have a drink together or whatever. All right, and we're still great friends. Right, I've got a, um, a a picture hanging in my office that an atheist friend of mine drew for me as a Christmas gift. All right, that shows um, me with an axe and him with a sword, <laughs> dueling with each other. All right, <laughs> and it's titled "Friends." All right, it's a big part of our friendship, but we care about each other. All right. He lives in New York, I live in Minnesota, we don't see each other very much. But, man, I would love to get together with him on a regular basis. <laughs> right? We're really good friends. And, and I know that, that if, if we live near each other, at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, there was a catastrophe, that I'd be able to call him up and he'd be there in a heartbeat. Um... I kind of already talked about this, but the desire to be right. Um, <laughs> whenever we disagree with people, we really want them to understand where we're coming from and see how wrong they are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, I, I run into this um, more often, not so much talking to my atheist friends, but, um, but just... Uh, talking to my wife when we disagree on something, and I want to be right. And being right is more important to me than our relationship. Right? Anytime that you're dealing with somebody that has a different um, perspective on things, then you might be able to see all the holes in their position. You go, that is just, they're so wrong. Or as my dad used to say, her head's full of mush. All right, but he would never say that to another person. He said that to me when they walked out of the room. <laughs> All right, you can debate about whether, you know, that was... But what he meant was that he didn't agree with their position and, and he thought that they had needed to learn a few things, All right? And yet at the same time, as, as, as opinionated as my dad was, I mean, like... The only time he turned off Fox News in his house was to listen to Rush or Hannity. <laughs> All right? Um, and yet, he, like, he could walk into a room in Madison, one of the most liberal cities in the country, and, and by the end of, after a couple hours, could tell you the life story of every one of those people. All right? And, um, and, and they all loved it. And, um, and it was because he listened to them and he didn't get in people's faces about his personal opinions. That's what family gatherings are for. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, also, don't assume people's motivations. You don't know where they're coming from. You don't know why they have the position that they have. You know? And... And maybe you have some sense of it, but be so quick to, when someone says something, does something, or whatever, and go, well, they're just being a jerk. Right? Nobody gets up in the morning and says, I'm going to be a jerk today. 
Oh, okay, probably somebody does. But even the, anyone that does, there's a reason for it. Right? Um, when, I, when I was in college, I took a class on playwriting. And, um, and the, our professor said, um, you know, remember, Hitler thought he was a hero. Right? People are motivated for the actions that they have. I mean, his whole point was, when you create a villain, don't just make him a sort of evil, nasty, mustache twirling, just wants to be evil kind of person. All right? Give them a motivation. Where are they coming from? Why are they like that? All right? And, and the thing is, real people are all like that. All right? We have reasons for doing the things we do. All right? And it could be that, well, I tried doing the, the right thing, and... It blew up in my face every time I tried, so I just gave up. What's the point of trying? All right? It could be, you know, and, and, and people, as far as their, their thoughts on God, all right, all over the place. There's no, you can't, you can't categorize people on that because everybody has different experiences. And, um, and so you can't just, just assume why people are thinking, feeling, you know, believing certain things. Um, you can ask them. People like to talk about themselves. Right? Um, and so, um, when you get to that point where you know them just well enough to ask, what do you, what do you think about this? Right? And then, listen. We'll get to more of that in a little bit. But, um, but yeah, be quicker to listen um, than to speak. Which leads to our next one, discussion without permission. Um, and this, this passage just like grabbed me by the throat a few years ago. Um, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Now, um, Peter throws a whole ton of stuff into this. It's just even this passage, and, and if you go back and read it in its context, which I highly recommend, um, you know, you get even more sense of it. But the part that jumped out at me as someone who's really passionate about evangelism was being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason. Anyone who asks you. Okay. Um, that's different than getting in people's faces. All right. So then, because when if they ask you, then they actually want to hear what you have to say. Um, there are times where. The more you know Jesus, you see it in your life. And especially in crises. When you can get through that crisis because you know that, you, that Jesus is with you. Right? There are times where people find themselves in crises. And, they, and especially if it's something that you've already gone through, and they go, how did you get through it? You can tell them. Right? I was uh, a guy I'm a big fan of. His name is, is uh, Hugh Walter. Um, he, he, does, uh, he does outreach by just like having fun when there's a, runs into a family that needs a place to stay or something like that. They just move into his house for a while. <laughs> We did that long term with adoption, though. But um, you know, he, and the funny thing is, is he's an introvert too. So <laughs> he hates having all these extra people in his house. But God keeps calling him to do it, so he keeps doing it. <laughs> but um, but one time he's he's in the car and and uh, and with with one of the the um, the guys, the husband of the couple that was staying with them and. Um, and he goes, you know, we've been living you with the, this 
uh, friend says to him, we've been living with you guys for a while, and and we noticed that like, you and your wife hardly ever fight. Like, like, pretty much never. What's your secret? Because we fight all the time. He's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, all right, so here's the deal. I can tell you, but I can't tell you without telling you about Jesus. I mean, like, I can let you, I can give you the whole thing, but I'm just going to, like, go Jesus all over you. <laughs> and the guy's like, hey, give it to me, I, you know, I need help. All right? Now, that's not saying that if you're Christians, you never argue with your spouse. Okay? Um, and, and, I mean, it kind of left me thinking, What's the secret, you know? Um, probably the secret is don't be an argumentative husband like I am. But, um, because I don't always practice what I preach. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at the same time, um, I, there's so many times, I mean, like today, um, my wife and I were at a, a meeting at school for one of our kids and, um, and talking about some stuff and, and, you know, talking on the way home and stuff. And, and I was thinking, man, I can't imagine going through this without Jesus. And and there's so many times where I would just completely fall apart, except that I know God is with me. I know that he's handling it. I know that, you know, and, and just all of that knowledge. Um, and knowing how he sees me, and, and I keep going on and on. So then when I run into someone who's facing some of those same issues and they go, oh, man, I, you know, this is awful and I'm really struggling with this. And I go, yeah, I struggle with that too. Right? Well, what do you do? Well, let me tell you. All right? And so it's being, it's being aware of we all share struggles, whether you're a Christian or not. And, and it's those times where, um, that's one of the big times that we have an opportunity to just to, um, to say, well, this is, this is how I get through it, All right? Or this is how I see things, or this is how I deal with it, you know, or whatever. Or, or even um, when, when there's a crisis in the news or something like that, to say, you know, yeah, this is really stressful and I, you know, I just, I feel bad for that person because I think, you know, how different their life could be um, if if they knew that God loved them, uh, things like that. So. All right. Another trap we fall into is immediate expectation. That's a caffeine molecule. <laughs> okay. So, you know, this, this, that, that, like, okay, if I just say the magic words, you know, or if I reach out to them at just the right time, I mean, they're just gonna, like, instantly just, you know, start, you know, reciting the Apostles' Creed or something. Okay. Um, you know, some people, they have those sort of, that moment in their life where the light just comes on. All right. And, and all of a sudden, oh, I get this. Okay, tell me more. And um, and all of a sudden, there's just like this burning hunger. Okay? And then there's other people that are like, okay, I like this part, but not the rest. Or I, eh, you know, well, let's just start there. Don't expect that that anyone is just going to just all of a sudden instantaneously um, just that, that when you say oh Jesus loves you <gasps> oh <laughs> but it all makes sense now <laughs> no it doesn't it doesn't even make sense to me <laughs> it makes sense to try to wrap your head around the trinity okay all right you still can't do it but um but the, I mean there's a lot to it. Um, 
and, and just it, it's a lot to it's a lot to absorb, right? And, um, and and be honest about the fact that we don't have all the answers. Um, there's uh, I, when I talk about theology, um, you know, uh, Paul talks about milk and meat. Um, <clears throat> first of all, don't give someone meat when they're not ready for it. it doesn't mean hide things from them. That's what cults do. Okay, um, but. You know, the, the milk is just the, the pure gospel. God loves you and how he sees you and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, you know, then there's, there's stuff that you got to chew on it for a while before you get it, right? And it can be helpful to, to walk with people as they're going through that, figuring that stuff out. But also be honest about the fact that some things, are, when it comes to theology, are gone. Right, you can chew on it and chew on it and chew on it your whole life, and it's never going to be to the point where you can just where it's ready for you to swallow it. Right, because God is bigger than our cantaloupe-sized brains, and so any God that you can completely fit inside your head is too small, and that's okay. And be honest about that. And um. I mean, I, there have been times where, you know, I've run into something and, and it was, all of a sudden it was like this faith crisis for me. Like, Wait a minute, I don't understand this. I can't, and you know, and it took a Christian friend to say, that's okay. You don't have to understand it. And I went, oh yeah. <laughs> that's okay. There's some things that decide to have we're not going to understand, right? And, um... And the Bible doesn't say that we come up, become omniscient when we get to heaven either. All right? I'm looking forward to learning at the apostles' feet. I'm looking forward to, to um, you know, hearing straight from Jesus. I'm looking forward to exploring the mysteries of God for eternity and never totally having it figured out. And just having those, those epiphanies and things being unlocked over and over. I love it when that happens. I don't want that to stop. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's okay to be honest about those kinds of things. All right. Do not emphasize soteriology over Christology. All right. Soteriology is, um, is the, the area of theology specifically focused on salvation. All right, and as Christology is on Christ Himself. Okay, um, I was talking to a friend who um, who is Eastern Orthodox, and um, and I was asking him, okay, so you know, tell me from your perspective, what's the what's the difference, um, you know, between you know, where you're at and and where I'm at and stuff. And he so, said, so here's the thing. The um, Orthodox Church split from Rome long, long, long before um, the Reformation came along. All right, and so the Reformation, Luther comes along and says, you know, there's all this preaching on salvation by works, and that's not how things work, and so we need to cl clarify that, right? And so. Big emphasis, and Lutherans to this day emphasize justification by grace through faith. All right? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. However, but he said, but for the Orthodox Church, our focus is not answering the question, how must I be saved? Our focus is answering the question, who do you say that I am? Who's Jesus? All right? which we get to this narrative that's in uh, Luke 3 of the Gospels. And when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? He said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Right. And then Peter still didn't 
understand what that meant because then right after that, um, he tries talking Jesus out of the crucifixion. <laughs> right? Peter didn't get soteriology, but he got his Christology. All right? And Jesus praised him for it. All right? Now, these two go hand in hand. You can't really understand one without the other. But often we can focus so much on saving people that really the point is to introduce them to Jesus. Um, uh, Andy Stanley just had a new book out. He's a pastor of one of the biggest churches in the country. Um, his father is Charles Stanley, who was a big name 30 years ago. And um, <clears throat> he, uh, the, the gist of his book is that the church was around long before the Bible was. I mean, you had the Old Testament, but, but the early Christian church didn't start out with the New Testament. It started out with Christ is risen. All right? And the focus, so then, um, you know, so he, he kind of says, you know, that whole Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. All right, in the early church, that wasn't the case. It was Jesus loves me, this I know, because he's risen. All right? No, and, and so he's been attacked uh, by people that they go, oh, well, he's saying that the Bible's wrong and, you know, and are not valuable or whatever. No, he, I mean, I've, I've listened and read enough of his stuff to know that he firmly believes in biblical inerrancy and, and all that stuff. All right. He knows his stuff. But um, his point is that, you know, when you're talking to somebody um, about, when you want to talk to somebody about Jesus, all right. Starting out with, if you have to prove that the Bible is true, completely true first, that's going to get in your way sometimes. It's not that it isn't, but are you trying to, um, to teach them about the Bible or are you trying to teach them about Jesus, the Word made flesh? Okay. And, um, and so if we focus, no, certainly if, if someone asks, you know, how can I be saved or, or, or something like that, if, you know, the subject comes up, you want to answer, right? <coughs> when we talk about Jesus, when we talk about who he is and why he came, all right, you're going to get here. But the main thing is to introduce him to Jesus. And let him know who he is, how amazing and wonderful he is. All right, it's about him. recently become Christian. Great! Well, now you've got to clean up your language. And no, I'm not talking about all of those four-letter words. Although, you do need to do that, too, or else <laughs> you're going to... <laughs> no, I'm talking about Christianese. You need to learn how to speak it and fast. Talk that talk so people know that you walk that walk. Thankfully, Christian speak is just a rebranded version of things that you already say. In this video, I will provide you with the tools you need to sound like a sold-out Christian. Oh, actually, that's a good place to start. You see, when you're a Christian, the term sold out basically means the exact opposite of what you're used to. Because you're used to it being a bad thing. Man, you know that band that we love? Yeah? They signed a major record deal and they sold out! Ah! But when you're a Christian... Man, you know that Christian band that we love? Yeah. Man, they're sold out for Jesus Christ. Amen, hallelujah. And now that you're a Christian, obviously you have to start going to church. And you used to be able to get away with saying stuff like it's too long or it was boring, but you can't say stuff like that anymore. If you want to convey that church went too long, just simply use the phrase, Wow, the spirit was really moving this morning. At least put a positive spin on it. I mean, ten courses of money to save and five key changes. It was alright. <laughs> and say bye-bye to those secular hangouts with your friends. Now you call it doing life. Selfie time! <laughs> oh, I love getting to do life with my girl. <laughs> and don't think that just because you're a Christian, you have to stop gossiping. Heckles, no! We just call them prayer requests. Hey guys, you might want to be praying for Rhonda. She's been talking about people behind their backs. Isn't that what you're doing right now? No. You're stupid. You might want to be praying for her, too, because she's been backsliding. Oh, and if some fellow believer asks you to do something and you don't want to do it, but you don't want to tell them 
that you don't want to do it. Just tell them that you'll pray about it. And speaking of getting a no, we Christians have our own way of saying that you've been friendzoned. Renee, I just have to tell you that I really like you a lot. Oh, James, I think about you more as... No, 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 don't say it. I would think about... No, please don't do this to me. Like a brother in Christ. <laughs> It's okay, James. That girl was probably causing you to stumble. And here's five more. A more Christian way to say that you want to be kind to somebody is to say that you want to love on them. It's just a thing we say. Don't read too much into it. The word anointed is equivalent to the word good, as in, he's really anointed on the guitar. Praying is equivalent to the word thinking, as in, I'm praying about if I should go to McDonald's or not. It's between you and God equals, I do not condone what you're doing. And the phrase, I feel led means I think that this is what God wants me to do but don't quote me on it because I'm not positive. The end. So there you go. Those should get you started. I mean there's a lot more Christianese for you to learn but believe me you'll have many different seasons of life to learn. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, now it, it even struck me that as I was watching this and um, I hang around and read enough uh, stuff from evangelicals to um, which right there is a, a Christian East term. All right, that means something completely different in the church than it does um, in the secular world, All right? Um, and, and in fact, just the fact that we're St. James Evangelical Lutheran Church, all right, I always wonder what do people actually think when they see that? Um, um, but, but Lutherans use jargon too. In fact, in a lot of ways, we, you know, we can even be worse. Um, so let's uh, throw some what what are some some jargon terms that that we use? Um, um I mean, we use words like I, I think about um, you know, uh, justified, sanctified. All right, um, where are we right now? We're in the fellowship room. Hmm. All right, which even ironically, if you uh, you know read like Luther and and stuff, they didn't use fellowship to mean sitting around and eating and drinking, and it, it's actually fellowship is, is a more technical term referring to um, to churches that are of one mind. It's it's more of a theological agreement and 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 sort of you know, serving together and, and things like that. And um, then, then it is about, you know, eating and drinking. Um, unless you're talking about communion, that's a fellowship issue. Right? Um, but, but we use that, that term. We got together, had fellowship. Yeah. Was that? Right. Um, I know when I preach, anytime I'm, I use a, a jargon word, I always like to... I'll, I'll, and I sometimes I forget. Okay? Um, so, you know, don't throw something at me when I don't. Um, but I, I like to say, uh, like I'll say, you know, Jesus uh, justified us. He declared us not guilty. He, you know, um, something like that. I'll, I'll, I'll define it as soon as I say it. Um, or I'll, I'll throw a, a few different synonyms. Uh, he gives us his righteousness, his his perfection, his his beauty, his purity, is you know, um, to to just to help people sort of go, oh, okay, from context, I can figure out what that means, all right? Um, <laughs> I, uh, when I was at seminary, I wrote a, a letter to the student paper, um, kind of about the use of jargon because it's even so much worse at seminary. Um, because it's, it's expected, and especially the students are sort of trying to impress each other and the professors and stuff. And, um, and my, my favorite, uh, or maybe the, the, the uh, theological term that I hate the most, um, 
is, now see if you can figure this out. It's a Latin term, all right? And you probably don't know a lot of Latin, neither do I. Okay. Satisfactio vicaria. <laughs> Any idea what that means? It means vicarious satisfaction. Now, you got to unpack that as talking about Jesus taking our place, right, um, and fulfilling the law on our behalf. And, and it's a, I mean, the, the, the concept, you can dig into it, and it's just a wonderful uh, concept. But uh, why are we using a Latin term that is literally the English words with O's and A's at the end <laughs> instead of S? And the argument is, well, you know, every every educational field has its own jargon. You know, doctors need to know their jargon, and, and you know, whatever field you're in, you need to understand the jargon. But the problem is, is that when when professors are teaching, um, uh, you know, soon to be pastors to talk like this, then you get out into the um, into the congregation, you got to do one or two things, right? You either got to keep stopping yourself from using those terms, or you use them and, and look really smart, <laughs> and and people have no idea what you're talking about, and and then you have to realize that oh, it's not about me; it's about Jesus. Um, and so while I, I'm not against those those terms, especially terms like righteousness and things like that, that are just like, there's no other word that I can just go, yeah, this other word captures all of that. All right. But you got to be careful when we use them. And because when you use terms like that, people hear that and, um, and they go, oh, to be a Christian, like, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, level of education that you need to have before you can belong. And, um, and so you have to be really careful about using those terms um, without having a good explanation. And so so I actually have um, an exercise on, on your sheet for you. I was going to do a little breakout with this, but um, I don't think we have time. Um, <clears throat> but what I encourage you to do is, is to think about those jargon terms. If there's terms that you use, right, and think about what they mean, right. And I believe it was Einstein that said something to the effect of, "If you can't explain it in a simple way, you don't really understand it." Right. Um, either think of what is another term that I could use, or what is a way that when I use that term, that I can explain it in a very simple way so that people understand what I'm talking about. Right? Because the other danger is you just come across as arrogant. And that's not what we're going for. Um, so, yeah, the synonyms or, um, and also, not just words, but cultural expectations that others might not know. Um, and it could be, um, you know, something like how you dress when you come to church is probably the kind of classic example of that, all right? But in that video, he kind of talked about, you know, using, um, using language. Uh, for, for one, there's, there's how we've kind of redefined terms, but also, um, you know, the whole four-letter words thing and, and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's other cultural expectations that we have some of which are, you know, rooted in God's law, all right? And there's a reason that, that we have those. Others, they're just Christian subculture. And, um, and, and so you can, you know, if, you, if you're not sure what those are, just kind of walk into a, like a Christian bookstore and, and walk around and, and look at, you know, titles of books, artwork, things like that, and think, okay, if I were not a Christian, if I knew nothing about the Bible, and I walked in here, what would I think of all these things? What conclusions would I draw from, from these things? And that, that would be a good place to start. Um, I mean, you can do it from the comfort of your own home by going to like christianbook.com or something like that too. So, um, 
but it, it, it's something to be aware of even you know just when you when you walk in here when you come to a service or something like that just kind of look around it and, and just stop and think all right if i were not a christian walking in here if i brought one of my friends who's not a christian you know what what would they what would their experience be like um one time i don't know i might have told the story last month but um uh, my daughter Danielle had a, a friend who had no church experience whatsoever. Did I tell you guys the story? No, I'm kidding. Um, and uh, and she says, so so I have this good friend. She's I mean, she's never been in church. She knows nothing about Christianity whatsoever. And um, so I was wondering, can I have her sleep over sleep over on Saturday night, and then um, have her come to church with us on Sunday morning? Huh? Well. Normally, we don't do sleepovers on Saturday nights because we have to get up early the next morning, but it's pretty hard to argue with that. So, yeah, sure. All right? <coughs> so, Saturday, she comes over. We're ready to eat supper. All right? Food's all out. We all start saying, come, Lord Jesus. All right? We get done. We say, amen. And she goes, what just happened? <laughs> And I thought, you know, and I thought about saying something beforehand, and then I thought, ah, she's at least seen table prayers on TV or something, right? No, it was. It, I mean, it was like it was like she just walked into a cult or something, <laughs> right? So the next morning, you know, like she came to the service, they sat like in the front second row, something like that. And there was always plenty of space up there, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it was a Lutheran church after all. And, uh, and, and so, um, so, you know, afterward, and, you know, Danny was trying to kind of explain things to her and help her, you know, through the service and stuff. And, um, and so afterward, um, after she went home, I said, well, Danny, you know, what did she, what did she think? And what did she say? She said, it was weird. <laughs> and you know what? It's true. All right. Our services for someone who's never had that experience and is completely that's completely foreign to them, it's weird, right? Where else in our culture do people sing together? Nowadays, it's not like you know, it's not like we're all um, you know at the bar singing "Doo Doo Leech Miriam Harrison" or something. Right, um, this, we're not there anymore, and uh, and so it's it's like there's certain things that we do. Uh, where else do you hear organ music? Right? There's there's other things like that that are just what what is this? Right? And we can own that. But yeah, all right. Let's recognize that some of the stuff we do seems strange. Right? We also talk about this guy that died and came back to life of his own volition. Okay? Let's be honest that that's pretty strange. Okay? There's a reason we do. But don't be surprised if you tell somebody that and they go, huh? That doesn't happen. Okay? Alright. Um, bait and switch. Uh, <laughs> I chose a praying mantis for this because I was I, th I think about praying mantises and that you know the female says to the male, "Hey, come mate with me." We done? Okay, now I'm gonna eat your head. <laughs> <laughs> wow! If there was ever a bait and switch, that's it right there. <laughs> All right. Um. But uh, you know, in in. Uh, we need to be upfront and honest with people about what we believe, where we're at. They ask a question, answer it honestly, even if we know they're not going to like the answer, right? But say, well, let's talk about it. Um, I, when I was in high school, I was dating a Mormon girl, and I uh, didn't know much about what they believed. And I'd ask her questions, and she would say, you're not ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean? Ask me what I believe. I'd, I'd be happy to tell you. Ask me what I believe about anything. I might get it wrong, 
All right, but I will tell you. I'd be happy to tell you. I would love to tell you. All right. But she was just like, no, you're not ready. Well, then when I got to seminary, I, I really wanted to know. And at the seminary, we had this whole section on um, on Mormonism, Latter-day Saints, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And so I started reading. And I found out, oh, oh, these are the guys that came up with Battlestar Galactica, and it's actually based on Mormon theology. Whoa. <laughs> All right. Um, and, uh, you know, the, they believe that God used to be a person and, and, uh, and lived a good life and earned the right to become God of his own planet. And, you know, and, and I went, oh, okay, well, now I can see why she didn't want to tell me. Because, yeah, I definitely wasn't ready for that. Still not. <laughs> All right. Um, but, you know, we recognize that not everything that we, um, I mean, okay, first of all, not everything that, that we believe makes sense to people that that have never heard it before, all right? There's some pretty bizarre stuff, all right? There's stuff in the Bible that is it's hard to swallow, all right? You just uh, ask anybody about the, um, about the, the Canaanite genocide, <laughs> all right? Yeah, go into the promised land and kill everybody. Well, yeah. I've had some conversations with my atheist friends about that one. They're hard conversations. And they're conversations that I ultimately have to say, I can't explain all of it. I can give you my thoughts on it, but I know that that's inadequate. Um, and, uh, you know, there's other stuff like that. All right. We also have to recognize that, you know, as much as we can talk about, see how they love each other, that as Christians, we don't always love each other. Even the people in our own congregations. Right, because we're not perfect, and uh, and we can't be flipping about it and go, "Well, I'm not perfect." No, that's a problem, and that's why we need Jesus so bad. Right. When we say nobody's perfect, it means something completely different, and it has to mean something completely different, right? But that's the beauty of the gospel. Um, but we need to be honest about that, and um. And, and not just sort of like in a defeat sort of way, but to go, yeah, I'm not perfect. And yet God still loves me. Isn't he amazing? All right, don't treat people like merit badges. All right, I've, I've mentioned I've got a lot of atheist friends, All right? We've been friends for years, right? Most of them still atheists. And you know what? Whether they ever come to, be, to know Jesus the way I know him or not, I'm still going to love them. They're always going to be my friends. <clears throat> right? I'm not friends with them. While some of them, the way that I originally connected with them was through <laughs> actually through sticking my neck out and and uh, speaking where I wasn't asked <laughs> and they were rather forgiving right. um, but uh, we value people and um, and we can't treat people like projects because God doesn't treat them like projects he loves them Right. So we just love them, and, um, and and of course we want them to know Jesus. We want them to have all the blessings that come with knowing Jesus. But that's because we love them, not we love them because we're supposed to, because like we need to be able to list some names on our homework to people to pray for, right? Jesus called us to love. And that, that doesn't just, he didn't say just go and serve, just go tell people, go love. Right? And, um, and, and so loving, loving is not a means to an end. 
right? While it does lead people to Jesus, right? We call on to love people. Period. Straight up. Now, as as we love them, when we have the opportunity to, of course, we want them to know Jesus, and then we're going to um, take those opportunities to share Jesus with them. But the relationship is all about just love. All right. So I, I ended up spending a lot more time talking than I expected tonight. Um, <clears throat> Because there's always more. <laughs> um, but any questions? All makes sense. <laughs> if, uh, you know, I'll say if, if you think of something, write it down, throw me an email, you know, whatever. Um, talk to me and, um, to, and keep it going. So, um, there's... Uh, one more question on there. I invite you to, to take that with you. And, um, and since we didn't get into a lot of this other stuff, I invite you just to take the sheet home and, and do some thinking about it. I do realize that just because our topic tonight was don't, that um, as you look through it, there's a lot of law here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and, and so, so I, you know, I, I want to make sure that that as we go through this and, and since a lot of what we're talking about is methodology right um that i just want to emphasize again that this is god has given us this amazing gift because we don't deserve it all right just because he loves us all right and so so we're gonna mess this stuff up all right almost everything that i said don't tonight i've done Right. That's why I have so much content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is opportunities to argue? Yeah. You want right. us to argue? No. I'm saying find opportunities, opportunities to argue. But don't argue. Right. And so instead of arguing, what do you do instead? You love, right? Yeah. 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 And so really what this comes down to is practice that. All right? Look for those, those situations where you know your your gut just tells you attack <laughs> all right but then stop pray all right god give me wisdom and help me to love him all right and then all right and this is this is a lifelong practice thing all right um you know all these all these don'ts Right? I still do these things sometimes. I catch myself, or someone catches me. Right? And so, um, and then that's what forgiveness is for. That's why we need Jesus. And um, and so, just you know, constantly be aware of that. And, and if you mess up, be quick to apologize okay. and um, and ask for forgiveness. And uh, because even if people don't know Jesus. Um, I found that if you come to them humbly, they can be pretty quick to forgive. Um, and in fact, they, probably because they're a little surprised, because humility tends to be in short supply in our culture. <laughs> and, um, and, and so, and, you know, when you, when you come to people and, um, it's just, it's one of the most effective evangelism methods right there. All right, just apologizing <laughs> because um, I'll have to one more thing. Um, talk about how different people have, like you say, evangelical means something very different to a lot of people. It has a lot of political baggage and stuff. Um, I know a lot of Christians that don't like to call themselves Christians. They call themselves Jesus followers because Christian has so much political baggage tied up with it. And, and, and historical baggage and, and all of that, they're like, I don't want to be associated with that. Well, you know, there was a time in my life that I didn't want to really be called human because I was so fed up with the human race. <laughs> right? But then I realized that, no, I'm actually part of the problem. And it's rather arrogant to say, no, that's not me. 
Um, and um, but that's why we need Jesus. And uh, and and I think that the term Christian, it, you know, it it was negative when it was first introduced. It was it was this. I mean, the early Christians didn't call themselves Christians; they were followers of the way. There's a little play on words there. They follow Jesus, the way, right? But he is the way. So they're on this this path, but Jesus actually <coughs> is the way. All right. But um, but it was uh, says so it was either I don't want to say Antioch, Athens. It says in the Book of Acts, and I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. Um, where they were first called Christians. But they're those 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 Christ people. I was talking about Christ. They follow Christ. Right? Which um, you know, a lot of people at the time didn't really understand what that meant. But that's that's that term that they use all the time. Right? And um, but it was it was kind of a derogatory thing. And um, I, I think we can own that and and say yeah, you know, th- there's a lot of derogatory stuff. Right? And I've been part of the problem too. And and I apologize for that. And uh, and I can't do anything about what other people say or do. And um, but I know that we're all kind of messed up and all need the forgiveness. All right. Um, let's do the prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the amazing love that you've given to us. And you you sent disciples. Uh, out very early in your ministry, you sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God, and and um, and I often think that there's a reason that what they actually said when they went out there wasn't recorded, um, because it was probably so much of it was wrong. Um, you see example after example in the scriptures of um, of, of how your people have failed, uh, and yet what we see over and over is your love and forgiveness, and how amazing that is. And um, so, Lord, let your love and your forgiveness flow to us, flow through us. Let other people see you in us, but also, um, and even more so, to see what you have done and continue to do for us and for them. We pray in Jesus' name.